I'm Jeff Jarvis from the Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY, and I've been arguing that what's most important in this crisis is to amplify expertise. Yes, we have problems of disinformation, but we've got to go to the experts, and we have to go to the appropriate, credentialed, relevant experts. So I've done two interviews so far, one with an epidemiologist, one with a, an infectious diseases expert. And today I have with me, I'm proud to say, Dr. Angela Rasmussen from Columbia's School of Public Health. Doctor, could you start just by simply telling us what is your um, expertise and why should journalists come to you? What should they come to you for? So I'm a virologist and I study the basics of how viruses infect people and more importantly, viral pathogenesis, so how they cause disease in people. Um, my particular area of expertise with viruses are emerging viruses, um, which are usually RNA viruses, such as Ebola, um, Enza, and of course, MERS and SARS coronavirus too. Uh, usually what I study is not just how these viruses work, um, but how they uh, induce host responses in the people that they're infecting. And those host responses can either be protective, meaning that they trigger uh, an effective immune response, clear out the virus infection, and mediate protective immunity, sometimes for life, um, or they can be pathogenic, meaning that the response um, and the host response to the virus infection kind of goes out of control. And that can itself cause disease and severe immunopathology. In the case of COVID-19, it's looking like uh, for many of the reports that patients are having what is called a cytokine storm, which means that there's really uncontrolled inflammation occurring in the lungs of these people that are infected and potentially in other organ systems as well. So that's the direction uh, COVID specific that my research is going in now. Um, do you care more once the virus has gone into the human being or how it gets there or both? I care about both, um, and I certainly can talk about transmission, even though it's not something that I study myself. Um, certainly within my field, uh, transmission is a hot topic of interest. Um, I don't make myself transmission models, um, but I have uh, collaborated with many people who study transmission in great detail, and I'm familiar with the mechanics of how that works, as well as how um, processes like cell entry of a virus, replication of that virus within the cell, um, and release of those virus particles in the cell work. Because all of those processes that the virus does require the host to be involved with that as well. Viruses co-opt the host um, to do everything basically that they're going to do, which is one reason why people often say arguably that viruses are not living beings because they can't reproduce without a host. So essentially everything the virus does the host involved with, and that is in my, my domain. Um, so uh, the first two interviews I did were with uh, Dr. Greg Consalvis from Yale and uh, Dr. Kutika Kupali, um, who's the infectious diseases expert. And they're both, um, each in their way, trenchant critics of media's coverage of this crisis. So I would like to hear your harshest view of how you think media are doing, journalism is doing, in covering uh, the pandemic? So in general, I think first I'll start off by saying that there are a lot of really excellent science journalists doing this. Too few, um, probably still. That's the problem. Too few. Um, in general, there's too few uh, journalists in general, I think. Um, you know, certainly in the last uh, few years, really for all of my career, we've seen sort of a lack of public interest in science across the board. That's been accompanied by a lack in funding as well. So oftentimes um, when scientists talk to each other, we don't do it in such a way that can be easily communicated to the public. So I'm very grateful that there are some of these science journalists who are not even covering, not just covering the science and explaining it to people in a way that's accessible, audience, but also covering some of the others that scientists may not have so much expertise in. Um, one example of this is Axman from Nature, who has, as well also uh, from STAT, who have covered um, Ebola outbreaks uh, and now the coronavirus outbreak in such a way that they're able to, to bring in some of these other issues related to policy, related to some of the social consequences, um, in a way that understands the cultural context in which these outbreaks occur and responses are done as well. So I'm really grateful for, for journalists like that. 
Also, there are some science journalists, um, Ed Yong from The Atlantic, for example, who really deep knowledge anyways of molecular biology and biology and infectious diseases, who can really, uh, Mary McKenna is another one, who can really um, get deep into the science with scientists like myself and then communicate that again to their audiences in a way that is really informed and insightful, but also accessible by those audiences. So having that said, said that, <laughs> having yeah. said that, um, there are also, I think, and I don't think that it's anybody's fault. Nobody's intending to be providing bad COVID coverage. But when you have, um, you know, features reporters who normally are doing interviews with like a small business owner locally, um, for example, or uh, who are normally doing sort of celebrity interviews or things like that, those people um, now have to be COVID reporters. And it's very difficult for them to, uh, to, I think, cover some of the nuances in the science, much as it is very difficult for scientists to communicate those nuances to people who don't speak science jargon. Um, I think that there are a few bad actors out there, people who uh, sort of deliberately sensationalize reporting or misinterpret it for the public in a way that, that drives clicks, essentially. Um, and I'm not naming names, but uh, I think that that can be really harmful too, because if those people have been active in, for example, outbreak reporting, um, which can be terrible in, in some of the takes, especially about outbreaks that happen in Africa or Asia, um, among people, most primarily affecting people who are not white, um, North American or European people, I think that sometimes uh, the reporting of those situations can be intentionally sort of sensationalistic. And I think that that in itself can also be really harmful because it stokes fear and panic. And that's not what you really want to do in a situation like this. Um, it, I've been talking to people about other Twitter communicators um, in science and how the tone from some people has sort of been intentionally um, sort of fire and brimstone, like the end is near kind of reporting. And we do need to take this seriously. I don't think anybody at any point has said um, outside of Fox News that uh, this is not anything to worry about. Um, but there's a difference between saying like, let's, let's move slowly based on the evidence, um, based on what we know and what we can be confident in. And let's not speculate about, you know, where bodies are gonna be buried. Um, I've heard recently that, that there was some reporting that bodies were going to be buried in, in like Central Park. Um, and Which I can't is not imagine- true. Not true. Yeah, that's absolutely yes. not true. But it's stuff like that that really, I think captures people's imagination um, and fills them with fear and certainly will get people to click on your link, but it's not, uh, it's not very responsible to be telling the population that that's definitely happening and these are sort of end time scenarios. What are we missing? What's, what, what angles of this, of this crisis and what's gonna come next do you not see coverage on that you wish you did see? So one thing I don't see coverage on, um, and honestly, this is maybe more of a question for you as to how journalists should be presenting this. But for example, hydroxychloroquine, um, which I know that you guys have a really hard time being that the president, every chance he gets, says that it's a miracle drug and a game changer and so forth. Um, it's very difficult to communicate the nuances of a, a well-designed clinical trial um, that is sufficiently statistically powered to the public when I've certainly had many people in my Twitter mentions um, over and over again posting this preprint, uh, which is now published, um, article by Didier Raoul that uh, was a very poorly designed study evaluating the efficacy of hydro hydro ugh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. It's okay. It took Trump a few weeks to figure out how to say it. So yeah. right. The thing is, I know how to pronounce it. I feel like I've said it so many times, but now I just, um, I can't pronounce it as well as I used to. <laughs> yeah, I um, so people presenting that, you know, showing it to me as evidence that yes, there has been a trial that's been done. Um, why am I ignoring this evidence? And it's really difficult. I've not been able to successfully communicate to people why that, that trial was not well designed. 
Um, if you say there was no good control group, people say, oh, there was a control group. Um, and there was, but it just wasn't a good control group. And one thing that I think I and my other scientists could benefit from immensely is being able to work with journalists to figure out how to communicate those types of nuances to people. Um, to say that this trial, sure, it's promising. It's not a reason to not do a clinical trial. It's not a reason not to prescribe it for compassionate use off label if a physician feels that that's the right option. With risks um, coming along, yes. Right, and it, people are already doing that. I mean, uh, there was a legal scholar on MSNBC last night who was saying that he was prescribed remdesivir, um, or he got uh, experimental remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, tocilizumab, um, and the uh, Calitra, which is the HIV-1 protease inhibitor combo. Um, all of the drugs that are being talked about uh, predominantly um, as being potentially useful. So I think that that's fine. Like it's for people who are on ventilators who are potentially going to die if no intervention is done, if they're a physician and them or the people who have their power of attorney think that that's okay, then that's fine. But we can't make statements like hydroxychloroquine is a miracle drug that can prevent or treat COVID. Well, um, I will confess to you, doctor, that I made the mistake of retweeting that original thing, uh, not seeing that it was going to come out of Twitter into Trump's mind and out his mouth and be presented this way. And I should have put context on it. I should, have, I should have seen, and somebody yelled at me, properly so, that this was, what, N equals 16 or something very small, and it wasn't a proper study. Um, so that leads to, to, to a question about how, well, let me back up for one moment. Um, I, I wanted to talk to you because I admire the way you handle Twitter, and I want to ask you about that in a second. And I, and I am very grateful. I started a Twitter list of 560 epidemiologists, virologists, infectious diseases, physicians, researchers, and so on, and it has been spectacular for me to be able to watch the science and the medicine going back and forth, uh, to be able to see the generosity of scientists with each other and with the public as well. Uh, but uh, context is difficult. And I've seen a lot of discussions about preprints and whether they should be visible or not. Some people saying that that's dangerous. Others saying, no, we've got to have this free exchange of information now, especially. So how do you, uh, having, you know, normally operating in a closed world of high expertise, uh, where you speak the same language and people aren't going to misinterpret you. Now you're out in a more public world where you've done a very good job, in my view, of explaining things in a way for the people. That's why media are calling you. Um, but you're also at the same time trying, trying to do your science with other scientists. How are you navigating that? What's your philosophy of social media? Well, um, my philosophy of social media is that I think that right now people need good information. And when I first started tweeting on this, so it, it, Twitter has been kind of crazy for me because I started the year with like 400 Twitter followers <laughs> and now I have 51,000. Um, and I'm grateful for people like you who've made the list. I, your list is fantastic. And it has introduced me to other people outside my own area of expertise, which is really, really important. Um, and in terms of my philosophy, I try not to comment on, on things that are really outside my, my wheelhouse of understanding. So while I know what an r naught is, for example, I can't discuss the finer points of these various predictive epidemiological models. I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, I'm competent to understand basic concepts in epidemiology and how they relate to virology, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a physician. I can't talk in detail about patient care either. I don't know what um, would be the diagnostic criteria for putting a patient on a ventilator, for example. I don't know what kind of drugs would be prescribed to a patient in certain situations uh, with certain lab results, et cetera. So I try really to only comment on things where I feel fairly confident in my own knowledge unless I'm expressing an opinion, which has sometimes gotten me in trouble in terms of my um, political opinions. And I've tried to be, you know, I've tried to not uh, tr frankly, trash the president. Um, I think that it's not constructive to just start um, spewing my internal monologue about some of the things that are said at those press briefings. Um, I'm really torn personally on whether they should even be televised. Oh, oh so um, am I. 
but I feel like I do need to see what is coming out of the White House and our coronavirus task force, um, because I think that it, it, in some cases, has actively been harmful to public health. Um, and I certainly have opinions on that. And, you know, I'm an American citizen who votes. Um, so I do, I do express my opinion sometimes, but I try to make it clear when I'm expressing an opinion versus when I'm breaking down a preprint or a scientific paper. And with preprints specifically, so I have been involved in that a little bit, um, that now BioArchive and MedArchive, uh, which I run out of Cold Spring Harbor Labs Press, um, now do have, it's not peer review, but all papers about coronaviruses are, or about COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2, are now vetted by, um, by somebody like me, and I'm one of the affiliates who does this, uh, just to make sure that they're not publishing crazy stuff. Um, because early on, I had some real problems with some of the preprints that were going in there. Because initially when this happened, I mean, we never, we've never had an outbreak where there were preprints available. So during the 2014, oh. 2016 West African Ebola outbreak, I was fortunate um, in terms of timing that my research ended up getting a very prominent um, paper in a high impact science journal. That was great, um, but that was a year after, almost a year after the outbreak started. Um, and it was one of the first like big Ebola papers that was out. And it wasn't even about the West African virus. It was about an animal model that I developed. Um, the first sequence data for that Ebola outbreak was published in Science in June of 2014. So six months after that outbreak had been going on. We didn't have preprint servers. Sequencing was not as, as rapidly um, available to everybody as it is now. So now, I mean, in this case, we had data on the genome sequences from the first cases in China the second week of January. Right. Um, they, and now we have, we have thousands of those genome sequences. That tiger sequence um, was published like barely 24 hours after the, the news came out that the tiger had even been diagnosed. So the pace at which science is being able to put out information is really unprecedented. And the preprint servers, I mean, the reason why the sequencing paper took so long, my paper took so long, was that they went through months of peer review before they could be published. And then there's an embargo on them. Now, anybody can publish anything on a preprint server. And prior to this, before there was a recognized need to at least make sure that preprint servers weren't churning out or weren't available to people who were going to publish papers that um, could be extremely misleading, to say the least, uh, you know, there was no, there was no need for any kind of preprint vetting. Um, but since then, it has become obvious after specifically the paper that claims that uh, SARS coronavirus 2 is a hybrid of HIV and, and SARS coronavirus. Um, that paper, I think that preprint in particular, really encouraged people because the effect that that had being reported by media who don't necessarily understand um, how a blast search works, which is essentially the method that was used to, to generate that conclusion. Um, people were reporting that, and that was being immediately taken up by people who wanted to say it was a biological weapon. I can't imagine a worse strategy for making a biological weapon than combining a coronavirus um, with HIV. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there was very uncritical reporting because that preprint was accessible to all and people weren't doing a good job of explaining to the right people why that paper should not be covered. Um, have preprints papers been have withdrawn been... off preprints? Yes, it was preprints? withdrawn from should the preprint withdrawn? server. Should the should that original uh, hydroxychloroquine paper have been withdrawn in your opinion? So or was it that's, still a whole, value? that's a whole other story. Um, Yes, I think it should have been withdrawn. Uh, but the problem with that was it was rapidly published mm -hmm. in a journal that mm -hmm. Didier Raoul is the editor in chief of. Right, that's the other issue, yes. Um, and now my understanding is that has uh, essentially a warning um, that, the, that the data in the paper may not be reliable, which is usually sort of a precursor to a full retraction. Um, so Go it's back. hard to say Sorry. if that's going to happen. But now that does have, um, it basically comes with a warning that's like, Good. Yeah. It's published, but, um, you know, treat it with caution. Let me go back to, in the media context, something you were talking about a minute ago about uh, your 
taxonomy of these things I can answer and these things I shouldn't. How often do media reporters and, and people on TV ask you things that you don't want, you don't feel you're qualified for, and what do you do when that happens? So on TV, um, that hasn't happened as much because I'm usually pretty clear with producers what I can answer and what I can't. I make it very clear that I'm not a medical doctor, which is usually the types of questions that I would get on TV. Um, like, how do you treat treat a patient? And I <laughs> if I don't think I've ever been asked that on like live television, but if I were, I would just say I'm not a physician. Um, that's a question for a physician, but I could answer this other related question, perhaps, depending on the context. Um, when I've been asked that by print reporters, usually they're emailing me or DMing me and asking me if I can talk about a specific topic. I never talk to anybody unless I know what they want to talk to me about. Um, Wise. And I, I generally don't talk to people who are not reporting for something that I've heard of or that I can check out. Because I don't, the last thing I want to do is end up on like some kind of Alex Jones like type website um, or have, have somebody take my words out of context or, or use me to endorse a product. Um, and a good example of that is I did a question answer for Goop, um, Gwyneth Paltrow's lifestyle <laughs> website, yes. which is a website that I've had a lot of problems with, and both in terms of the pseudoscience that they promoted, as well as the attacks that, that some of their people, including Gwyneth Paltrow, have made on other experts in their fields um, for essentially calling them out. I only agreed to talk to them because I, I was, well, one of my colleagues recommended that I do so because it would be reaching an audience who generally feels um, left behind by sort of conventional science and medicine. And I only agreed to do it if they, if they said that they would not um, use anything that I did to promote their products. Um, and in fact, when it was published, there was like a banner ad on the side for like supplements. And so I emailed the, the woman who had interviewed me and she took it down immediately. They, she said that it was a mistake. So something like that, you know, would be, I would have to agree to the terms on which right. I would, I would talk to them. Um, but in terms of, of other things, if I'm just asked a question about something that's outside my expertise, I'll usually either say that's outside my expertise, um, or I can, in some cases, recommend somebody that would be better to answer that question. So, so let me ask you that question. So, so far I've talked to, as I said, an epidemiologist, a, an infectious diseases physician, you a virologist. What are the other key uh, pieces of that collegial puzzle uh, that, that journalists should be seeking out, or I should seek out, but, but we should seek out to, to add up to a fuller picture? Yeah, so um, if, if people want to talk about policy, for example, um, I have no expertise other than my opinion um, as, you know, a, again, a voting American citizen. So if somebody wants to ask me some real particulars about policy, I'll usually refer them to Dr. Alexandra Phelan, um, who has a, a great deal of expertise and is also an attorney. Um, Dr. Gonzalez would be another great option for that. Uh, people who have policy experience and other people who are not necessarily scientists. So like um, Jeremy, oh gosh, I can never pronounce his name. Um, Jeremy Con Conendic, I think. Oh, yes, um, yes, yeah. I know. I, yeah. I, so I, he I can was, see the um, name, I can't say it, yes. Yes, he was in charge of Barack Obama's pandemic um, response team, uh, or USAID's response team. Um, Ron Klain, uh, who mm -hmm. was the Obama Ebola czar, Again, not scientists, but very knowledgeable about policy and logistics and things like outbreak response, things that, that I have no idea about because I've worked in a lab. Sometimes I'll be asked about field work. Um, I have other colleagues who um, are, are more experienced with sampling animals, for example, in the field, sampling wildlife, and have a, a much deeper knowledge of sort of eco ecology um, and how the environment factors into that. So I, I will certainly recommend that. Epidemiologists, um, when talking about sort of models and predictions, as well as how to interpret data that's coming from different places. So while I said I do have you know, a basic understanding of what the R naught, what the attack rate, what those things mean, I can look at case numbers and make basic conclusions. But if asked a really fundamental question about 
what does this say for the future? What does this indicate about the populations that it's affecting? Those questions are definitely better for an epidemiologist than somebody like me who, who just understands fundamentally how viruses work and cause disease. So if I were to try to, uh, if a reporter were doing a story about the, the apparent prevalence in some populations of male victims of the disease at the, at the extended edge, or the data that, that we saw today from Chicago, 30% uh, of the population is African-American, 70% of the fatalities are African-American. That kind of story, where do we go to, to get our hands around, around that? Is that? Is that you in virology? Is that biologists? Is that epidemiologists? Where might there be the beginnings of answers? So to a degree, the sex difference question is a question that I could partially answer. And sex differences is actually something that I look at um, for Ebola in a mouse model that I use. So I do understand, and I'm very familiar with um, the literature that, for example, Sabra Klein at Johns Hopkins has published on sex biases that are sort of biologically mediated. Um, however, when we get to the more men smoke, more men for MERS coronavirus interact with camels, that sort of thing, if you wanna go into a really deep uh, analysis of that from an epidemiological perspective, you definitely need somebody um, who's either an epidemiologist studying those things or somebody who would even be like an anthropologist who, who might be able to speak um, to the behavioral components or cultural components that go into that type of work. One thing that strikes me about this, uh, I've been involved in the political disinformation world and the fact-checking world and social media and so on. And that's difficult for all the reasons we know. One of the beauties about this is science has a taxonomy. Uh, the disciplines have a taxonomy and the question, the appropriate questions can be routed to the appropriate experts if we can do a better job of that. Yes. So let me ask another question about, about the, the, the field of people that you see. You said that on Twitter, you've, you've met new people in, in that kind of area of other disciplines. Uh, there was a story in the New York Times the other day um, that talked about the heroes of science in this story. And as you know, they were all white men who looked like me. Um, and, and many people, including me, had fits online about this. And um, uh, the first fit was that they were all men, but the second fit was they're all white. Uh, diversity in science. Um, and one of, I, I think it's, uh, I can't remember which, uh, it's Kizzy PhD, now I'm forgetting. Uh, uh, Kizzy Micaiah Corbett. Thank you, Corbett. Um, I think she got into, a, into something on Twitter today with somebody saying, well, it's, it was reverse racism to talk about that, which is pathetic and wrong. What does the, the, the impact of diversity, international diversity, uh, ethnic diversity, obviously gender diversity in science uh, that media clearly are not getting very well? They're getting a little bit, I think on TV, I think that they're trying a bit. But what I've seen too often in newspapers is they're not trying very hard at all. Um, so, so talk to me about, about as, a, as a woman scientist, uh, how you've experienced that for just a moment, if you don't mind. So yeah, of course, um, this is a topic that is uh, very close to my heart. Um, as academic, it's not just the media that's guilty of the sort of gender bias and, uh, and a diversity bias, I would say. Um, there is a, a prevalent myth in both the popular culture and in academic culture that science is done by these sort of lone genius dudes who <laughs> are in their labs, like working hard day and night, um, and that's all they do, and they're these sort of science machines, and that's kind of how they are immortalized. So that we're talking about people now um, like the men who were, who were featured in that article, many of whom are, of course, great scientists. Yeah, no, um, taking great nothing away from them. Just, I have nothing just but respect for Dr. Fauci. Um, but, yeah. and, and he's a very accessible person, too, the few times that I've met him. Um, I have nothing against any of them, but this myth that Dr. Fauci is the only person working at NIAID is, is also kind of ridiculous. Um, he is our nation's, uh, the NIH's leader of our primary infectious disease institute. But that work, um, you know, Kizmikaya Corbett is one example of uh, somebody who's not an older white man who Works is doing there fantastic work. On vaccines. Or, yes. Right, on vaccines. And who I think would be, you know, we see Tony Fauci every day, and I'm, I'm glad that we do. 
Um, but I'd really like to hear more from her um, about the work that they're doing because the work that, that they've done has enabled this vaccine to go into clinical trials in record time. And having more people like that featured, but not even, not even people uh, like Dr. Corbett, who's relatively early in her career, but also there were no senior women featured in that. So people like Marion Koopmans, for example, is the director of um, the virology groups at Erasmus Medical Center. Um, and uh, there, there are a number of prominent women working uh, at the World Health Organization and at the CDC, Anne Chukot and um, Nancy Massonier, uh, they, they were not featured. And all of those people are, are working very hard. I mean, in microbiology, the majority of PhDs uh, in the workforce being churned out by schools are women. Um, and they're not, unfortunately, underrepresented minorities are still underrepresented, but it's not like there are none. Um, there are plenty of people that uh, that could be have been included in that who are doing great work, and I think one way in this um, that this needs to be really highlighted is you know who was excluded from that article, Tedros, Dr. Tedros, the head of the World Health Organization, um, who was previously the health minister of Ethiopia and is our global um, health authority. So it. Clearly, you need to have these other perspectives. And just yesterday, I think, I saw reporting um, that Dr. Tedros uh, himself had objected to an interview with a couple of French scientists who were white men, um, saying that they thought that Africa would be a great place to test vaccines. Um, and Tedros pushed back quite forcefully, saying that, you know, this is a, I believe he called it a a uh, hangover from colonialism. Um, but without those diverse perspectives, there is a lot of work that that can, uh, that might be overlooked and also unethically um, performed uh, or performed on populations that might be considered, okay, we can test on Africa because what do they have to lose um, kind of idea which I think is, is really harmful. And it really also prevents us from moving forward. Um, we're scientists, we all got into this uh, because, at least I did, because you, know, you wanted to make the world a better place. Not because I wanted to like sit and spin my wheels in this sort of white male Western patriarchy. Um, and I think that when you ignore the other voices, uh, then, then that's what you're getting. If, all you're hearing from are these, you know, prominent white men. Really said, and thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, my lesson, I, I got inspired to start the Twitter list, just to Josh Marshall, who's a really good political um, uh, writer at Talking Points Memo, has a, has a Twitter list with far more users than I have, but far fewer doctors in it. And I just started going on and adding and adding and adding. And the, I've taken some off. And I've been warned away from some people who don't have the expertise and have been using this. And if you see anyone, please let me know. Um, uh, it's interesting, the, the same names tend to pop up. Uh, yes. Of people who are exploiting <laughs> this for their own egos. Um, and certainly I don't want to get near the armchair epidemiologists who think they know data. But, but with that caveat aside, it was not hard to end up coming up with, I think so far, 560 people who are awe-inspiring. Yeah, in, in their knowledge, in their in their credentialed expertise and experience, and in their generosity of knowledge, uh, people I put on that list are the ones who do tweet and do talk. Uh, there are other brilliant people who are too busy or who don't, and that's fine. Uh, but but th there's no excuse for media not to find brilliant people uh, from different perspectives uh, in this. Well, I'm taking a lot of time. Let me just ask one or two more questions, and then I'll, I'll let you sure. go back to your important work. Um, uh, just as another example, like, like the gender and race question, the, the question of the week has been masks. So uh, how should we have been covering that question? So this is one that um, I've been sort of personally mystified by how, uh, how strongly people feel about masks. Um, to me, the data is fairly clear that masks uh, may have some limited protection, and by that I mean surgical and cloth masks, um, in reducing respiratory droplet production. Um, I think that's well established, but the evidence that they protect broadly when used by a population, I don't think there. And this is, this is a question, though, 
that I would defer to colleagues who work in inve infection prevention and control, um, like Dr. Saskia Popescu is usually my go-to for these types of questions about the data that's there, because I'm not um, as well-versed in all of the data, and there are mountains of it, about how to safely remove and put on PPE, for example. Mm -hmm. um, all the studies that have been done to show exactly how N95 masks work versus surgical masks. But the data is not really there that shows that masks at the population level make a huge difference. They might make somewhat of a difference. And a recent paper just came out in Nature showing that surgical masks did reduce the amount of virus, including coronaviruses, that were um, expressed in droplets through the mask. So, I mean, that's encouraging. And what I had been telling people to do, but of course, sometimes this gets lost on Twitter. And this has been sort of a learning experience for me um, in terms of how I've talked about this, is that on Twitter, people seem to think that if you say that there's no evidence to support the idea that masks, that masks for all is going to significantly reduce transmission, which I have not seen, um, then you're accused of being sort of an anti-mask person. And I was accused of mask shaming, which I don't even, I didn't even know was a thing. Um, for the record, I mean, I don't, I don't think that people are too stupid to learn how to put on and take off masks. But when there are extremely mixed messages coming from our public health leadership, including the White House and including the president, who the other day said, there's mask guidance now, but I'm personally not going to wear a mask. Um, what are people supposed to think? So I've encouraged people, masks are fine, but make sure that you're taking them off and wearing them correctly. Meaning, I mean, I have seen so many examples of bad mask wearing. Um, people, uh, I was in the airport, the last time I was in the airport, I saw a woman wearing a mask, this was at the beginning of March, wearing a mask um, that, and gloves, uh, that she pulled the mask down under her chin, to talk on the phone, eat a salad, and drink a glass of champagne, <laughs> and with gloves on, with the mask on her neck, and then she put the mask back on. And that is uh, not a good way to wear a mask. And some studies have shown, that at least experimentally, it could potentially increase your exposure risk. So, but trying to communicate that to the public um, has been very difficult, and I don't really understand why, other than that perhaps, People are kind of looking for, you know, something that they can do beyond just staying home. I think, I think and that's, that's, that's understandable. Yeah, and I think that's true. I think it's, it's, it's part of the argument about why toilet paper disappeared. It's something you could control. Um, right. But interestingly, you mentioned too, I'm seeing TV reporters not modeling good behavior with masks. I've so, seen it so, multiple times on the local news. It drives uh, me nuts. I mean, it would be helpful, I think, if you tweeted out and said, hello, people. Um, this is what you're doing wrong and how you're modeling this wrong for the public. Yeah. Um, so let, let me just ask idea. one last question here. Um, um, you are an excellent explainer and communicator. You're a brilliant scientist. We also do that. I mean, today you had a, had a thread explaining um, a, science, a, a study out of China uh, that was flawed and how it was flawed. And I understood it, uh, which I, I'm grateful for. That's my goal. Uh, and it, you, you, you do very well. Um, uh, but I hear a lot of talk within the science about whether scientists should be better communicators. Is that re their responsibility? Scientists get taken to mm. um, uh, media training school, and I guess that's fine. But I don't want to change the scientists. I want to change the media side of this. So I guess I, I, my last question for you is whether you have any questions for me about, about how, how media operate and any mis mysteries about what we do and why we do it that, that, that would clear up um, uh, head scratching moments for you in this experience? Yeah, I guess probably my biggest question, and it really, so in my experience so far, and in my experience, because I did talk a lot to the press too um, during the Ebola outbreak, um, is sort of how, like, I guess it really depends on the journalists and who they're reporting for. Um, as I said, I've, I've been able to screen out journalists who are less scrupulous, although, I mean, I was talking to a journalist from Newsweek who had clearly just been put on like the COVID science beat, period. Um, previously, he'd covered something like exercise or 
something like some health and wellness kind of thing. Um, and he said that his editors wanted a positive story. And I said, well, you know, there are bright spots, but right now, like, I'm not an epidemiologist, first of all, but so far, all the data that the epidemiologists are talking about, the projections are pretty grim. Like, I don't want to be positive. And this is a news week. I mean, this is supposed to be a it news was. magazine. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now, I mean, it, it, it was very upsetting, sort of. And I mean, it, it wasn't the reporter's fault. Like, he's doing his job. Um, but it's, it's difficult to understand how um, some publications, I guess, have a sort of mission to report the news in a certain way that puts a certain spin on it. And again, I know that some, some outlets are definitely more biased than others. Um, and I'm always careful when, when talking to a reporter from something that has a reputation for being more biased, like Mother Jones or something like that, that I'm always very careful not to make political statements that, that would be taken out of context because that's not really my job. Um, <clears throat> But I guess I'm just kind of curious how it works. Um, you know, I always thought that, and I, my last experience with journalism was writing opinion articles for my college newspaper. So, um, you know, I thought that everybody sort of adheres to basic ethics, meaning that if I say something's on background or off the record, it has to be, um, if, you know, it's on the record, then it's, fought, then it's fair game. Um, and also to sort of be, objective reporters unless they're explicitly writing like an opinion piece. But I, I guess like it would be helpful to know um, how I could better sort of discriminate between people who might want me, who might be trying to steer me to say a certain thing rather than asking me for my expert uh, opinion and knowledge. It's an insightful view of our business uh, from the outside. And um uh, it's it, there's bias, yes. There's 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 desire for clicks. There's all that, but there's also uh, hearing you talk about this. I would put it as a process bias, um, and we face this in a journalism school where where we tend to say to students that the first thing they do is come up with some story ideas. Uh, I started a new degree at our school with my colleague Carrie Brown. We call social journalism, where we do not start with the content. We start with the community, and we tell the students adamantly that you are going to go observe and listen to and empathize with and reflect these communities before you come back and think what the journalism is. They almost act like anthropologists first. Yeah, I was going to say that sounds pretty scientific. It's well, we could do a better job of that. I need more methodology. But yes, there's an anthropological view of a of a discipline of evidence. Um, and and so that blows heads up. Because the presumption is, I know what the story is, and I'm going to go get the story. So when we think as journalists that we listen, we don't really listen. We listen for quotes to put in the story that we already have kind of as an outline. So that's a problem that I'll just confess with our field that I'm trying to change, not very successfully, but trying. I guess my advice would be what you're already doing, which is you're obviously very sensitive to that when you hear it, um, and on the, on the rare occasions when I get journalists calling me and this happens, I can recognize pretty quickly, this is the story you want. And if I don't think it's the right story, I tell them that. And I, and I give them advice and say, I think you've got a, a better story here. Or here's a different story. Now, sometimes they are caught in a vice with their editor. Uh, and then the worst that happens is you get left out of the story because you didn't play along. Right. The best that happens is that maybe you influence journalism in a way that they can go back to their editor and say, we were wrong that there's, there, the story here is different and that's what we should be doing. That's what every journalist should be doing. We should be learning out in the field. You know, the, the reason I started this was just simply because I see, not universally, but I see journalists doing a bad job of sourcing, right? The New York Times offered op-ed space to a diet doctor and advisor to the California Walnut Board. Yes, and I'm thankful for Dr. Gonzalez for- Oh, uh, my ever, he's the greatest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I even complained today, so, so MSNBC's go-to guy on medicine is doing a, a good job. I don't have any complaint with him, but he's a spinal surgeon in this story, right? So we're doing a bad job of sourcing, of knowing where to go. We just pluck a scientist and we think we know what the story is and we're gonna ask the same question that we think we're just doing that on behalf of a dumb public. I guess all I would say is, I think you have more power over the journalists as scientists than you know. 
Yeah. That you can tell them, sorry, I, that's not the story. And if that's what you want to do, then leave me out. That's one way. But let me try to talk you through this and show you the different story. I think that, uh, yes, you right now have a lot of sports reporters and entertainment reporters who aren't covering sports and entertainment or are suddenly covering COVID. And they don't know what the heck they're doing. And if they have half a brain, they'll be grateful. And doctor, I am very grateful. I've taken, taken far more time than I imagined, but, but uh, I've learned a lot from you. And, and uh, I hope that some journalists will listen and learn from you. And I, again, I thank you for your work. And I thank you for your generosity online. Well, I thank you for having me on here. Um, I think that right now, you know, we're really in um, a, a global crisis and people need information. And I'm grateful to have you promoting my voice along with the voices of many other colleagues because we're really all a mosaic um, coming from different perspectives and different areas of expertise. And if the end result of this, um, however it turns out, even if it's very grim, in terms of the public health numbers, I do think that the public has an increased appreciation for science um, and hopefully people will be more science literate. And that's largely because of work that you and your colleagues are doing to help us communicate with people. Um, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about this since usually when I'm talking to reporters, it's it's, I mean, it's related subjects, but it's not about the actual act of journalism and communicating this information to the public. I think it's just so important. And I think my philosophy overall is that information empowers people. And right now, when we're all in a situation where we're all pretty helpless against this, um, the most empowering thing can be to understand the virus that we're facing, which is what I can help with, to understand what the risks are, which is what epidemiologists can help with, to understand um, how policy is being made, which uh, people from the policy groups can, to understand the ethics of some of these things, which bioethicists can. Um, there are so many people from so many different perspectives and areas of expertise that are contributing to this the one real bright spot for me is that we've been able to connect with each other and then to connect with journalists like you who are giving us the opportunity to, to sort of communicate this to the public at large because you really can't have public health without the public. So um, I'm very grateful uh, to be invited to be part of this and I'm very grateful to be on your list. Um, it's a great list. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I also thank you for your advocacy and support um, for women and people of color in the sciences. Well, I, I'm more grateful, but thank you very much. I guess I should plug the Twitter list. If you just go to uh, bit.ly bit.ly slash Twitter COVID list, you'll find 500 brilliant people like Dr. Rasmussen. Thank you so much. Thank you too, Jeff. Take care. Stay safe.